hearts unfold like flowers before thee. Sun above, melt the clouds of sin and sadness, drive the gark of doubt away. River of immortal gladness, fill us with the light of day. All thy works with joy surround thee, earth and heaven send thy day. Stars and angels sing around the center of unbroken praise. Field and forest, vale and mountain, flowery meadow, flashing sea. Singing bird and flowing fountain, call us to rejoice in thee. Thou art giving and forgiving, ever blessing, ever blessed. Wellspring of the joy of living, ocean depth of happy rest. Thou art Father, Christ our brother, all who live in love are thine. Teaching how to love each other, lift us to the joy divine. The word of the Lord says, ask and it shall be given to you. Seek and you shall find. Knock and it shall be opened to you. Church. Or what is there of you whom if his son asks bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks a fish, will he give him a servant? If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your Father, which is in heaven, give good things to them that ask him? And when you stand praying, forgive if you have aught or anger against any, that your Father also, which is in heaven, may forgive you your trespasses. Church. Amen. Let's continue singing right along with that same passage. Tell it to Jesus. Are you weary? Are you heavy hearted? Tell it to Jesus. Tell it to Jesus. Are you grieving over joy departed? Tell it to Jesus alone. Tell it to Jesus. Tell it to Jesus. He is a friend that's well known. You've no other such a friend or brother. Tell it to Jesus alone. Second verse. Do the tears flow down your cheeks unbidden? Tell it to Jesus. Tell it to Jesus. Have you sinned that two men's eyes are hidden? Tell it to Jesus. Third verse. Do you fear? Do you fear the gathering clouds of sorrow? Tell it to Jesus, tell it to Jesus. Are you anxious what shall be tomorrow? Tell it to Jesus. Final verse, are you troubled? Are you troubled at the thought of dying? Tell it to Jesus, tell it to Jesus. For Christ's coming kingdom are you sighing? Tell it to Jesus alone. Tell it to Jesus. Tell it to Jesus. He is a friend that's well known. You've no other such a friend or brother. Tell it to Jesus alone. Amen. Uh, Y'all may be seated. Eric, I see you here. We want to welcome you back. You were here last Sunday, but you're back on leave. So God bless you, man. It's good to see you. We're very, very proud of you and your wife and your family. Good people. Y'all, our next Connect group starts this Wednesday night. It's based on Max Licato's book, God Never Gives Up On You. And I think we're going to drop a, a video real quick to show you just kind of the gist of what this class is about. Sister Jane. Have you ever wondered if God can really use someone like you? 
I thought that about myself. We mean well, but we don't always do well. We have breakthroughs and breakdowns, <laughs> often in the same hour. Amen. I'm Max Lakato, and in my new book, God Never Gives Up on You, I'll introduce you to what I call the Tilted Halo Society and one of the Bible's most prominent members of this group, Jacob. He was less a prodigy and more a prodigal, strong on savvy, low on conscience, yet God never turned his back on Jacob. His story reminds us that God uses imperfect people for his perfect plans. He turns our brokenness into blessings through his grace, mercy, and relentless love. Be encouraged, friend. If God can use Jacob to accomplish his plan, he can use us too. Always remember, God never gives up on you. We have a case full of those books up here. They're $10 a piece. You can't get them cheaper anywhere else. I think, they, I think we bought them for 20 or water, maybe 23, I don't know. But those are available to you. Uh, up front. If you can't afford $10, just take one. It's okay. We, we really want you to get in this class. Join us on, uh, we're uh, wanting to spread some happy birthday stuff to Rita Johnson. Rita Johnson, you, some, some, maybe, maybe lots of you don't know her, but she's 90 years old uh, on May 20th. She's a resident out at Craig Manor. Uh, we're trying to do a kind of a birthday card shower for her. So during the rolling announcements, her address is on there. Me next week, we'll make sure it's up during the announcements, but uh, get a card for her. Man, 90 is a big deal. Uh, join us on Facebook every morning, people who are reading through the Bible, uh, because we believe that Jesus shapes our lives through his word. And I want to thank Tabitha Hall for doing that for us every morning. She's a great uh, asset to that ministry. And we'll be taking up offering, uh, we'll be taking uh, offerings for the roof until the end of April, which I think la next weekend is our last uh, Sunday for that, but I'll let you know that. We want to thank you for being here. Thank you so much. I'm Pastor Mike. That's my wife, Miss Pam, over there on the keyboard, and we're glad that you're here. Whether you're here, whether you're seeing us on Facebook or whatever platform, we're glad that you're here. Let's go to him in a word of prayer. Lord, today, you, uh, you've asked us to come here. Lord, you've, you've invited us into your house. We've set this day aside and we've kept it holy. So, Lord God, we're coming to you. Uh, some of us are here and we're, we're, we're battered and we're tore up. We've had a horrible week. Some of us are here and we had the best week of our life. But, Lord, regardless, you're God. Whether we've had a great week or, or, a, or a horrible week, your God, we're going to trust you this morning. We trust you, Lord, with our, our life, our eternity, our soul, our family. Everything we have, Lord, is yours. God, I pray that today we would worship you in spirit and truth, knowing that you are the God over us, over our world, over our private world, and you are concerned about us, and you're as close to the mention of, of your name, and you never leave us, and you never abandon us. Regardless of how we feel, Lord, you are faithful. Thank you so much for your promise, and Lord, we worship you this morning, for you are the good, good shepherd. You are the shepherd that leads and guides and protects and provides and, and, uh, and, uh, and, and uh, takes care of us. We love you, Lord. It's in Jesus' name we pray. And amen. Oh, good shepherd. 
Christians have been known as men and women of prayer, people who lift up their cares and concerns to the Father in heaven. Why is that? Why do we Good job, man. pray? We pray because it aligns the mind of the Christian with the will of Christ. We pray because Jesus commanded us to pray at all times, in all places. We pray because the God who knows all and sees all, hears all. We pray because it is the blessed link between human weakness and divine omnipotence. We pray, not because it is some religious rule, but because the Lord is God. We pray because it is the most simple and practical way to say, I am not God. We pray, not because it is a burden to us, but because it liberates us from all other burdens. We pray because it is exactly what the devil does not want us to do. We pray, because God can do more in five seconds than we can do in five years. Amen. We pray because it is the one thing that supersedes everything else on our to-do list today. We pray because we are too busy not to pray. We pray because somewhere, sometime, someone prayed for us. And we pray because the greatest tragedy of the Christian life is not unanswered prayer, but unoffered prayer. Prayer is powerful. That's why we pray. Amen. Hunter, it's good to see you here, brother. You're here. You're stationed down in Shreveport, Louisiana. It's good to see you too, buddy. I saw you over there just now. Y'all, prayer is the most undervalued, underutilized power in our lives as Christians. It's the most underutilized power for our families and the church, you name it. Uh, prayer is, the crazy thing is, man, prayer is that, it's the wire. It's the conduit that God will send promise to us, blessing to us. It's how he gets stuff from heaven to down here. Now, the crazy thing is, whether people are religious or not, most people pray. Uh, there's an old song by, uh, oh, I know there is no heaven, but I pray there is no hell. What was that song, Brother Don? We were just talking about it. And when I die, uh, people that may not even believe in heaven or God, but they'll still pray. Y'all, I tell you that because God has put something inside of us to make us want to reach to Him, to talk to Him, to get information from there to here. Last week, we kind of began to unpack this. We looked at the guy named Jacob, which is kind of the central figure of the God, uh, God Never Gives Up on You series. But what we found out last week is that he was kind of, well, his name Jacob means liar, heel grabber, deceiver, grifter, you name it. Means, you know, not a good gombre. Uh, he was born trying to pull his older brother back in so he could get out, so he could get the blessing, so he could get that birthright blessing. He had a big fight. Him and his brother didn't get along very well. Wound up uh, deceiving his brother out of all the money, all the family money, two-thirds of everything. He... Uh, he, he tricked his old man, Isaac. He tricked his old man, Isaac. Uh, Isaac said, man, I'm hungry. Esau, go get me that big buck and let's come back and make it for me. 
Well, while Esau's out hunting, Jacob and his mama uh, contrived this plan where they're going to send Jacob in there uh, in, in goat's hair and smeared with venison blood, smelled like his brother Esau. And, and you're going to hear a little bit more of that story. But what we found out in that story is that later on, uh, Jacob would run away from home because Esau says, I'm going to kill you, sucker. So for about 20, 30 years, Jacob is, is away into a, a, another land. But in that 30 years, he takes life by the, by the, by the horns and just, I mean, he gets it. He makes money. God comes to him and says, dude, can you go back home? I'm going to be with you. And Jacob says, okay, Lord. So he starts going back home. He starts beginning to think, man, things tough. When I left, man, my older brother says he's going to kill me graveyard dead. You're the one who told me to go back. You better be with me. Dude shows up in the middle of the night with Jacob. And the, the Bible says it's a man from heaven, capital M. We don't really know the name of this guy, but we're fairly sure it's Jesus. Because he names the place Peniel, which means the place I saw God face to face. And an angel in God. And, and uh, during that fight, this person that's wrestling Jacob says, Dude, you got to let me go. It's almost daylight. Y'all, this isn't, a, this isn't a vampire. There's just a reason why the guy says it's almost daylight. He'd been wrestling with this guy for a long time. And what we see coming out of that fight is a picture of wrestling. It's a picture of wrestling God in prayer. You ever wrestled with God in prayer? Mm -hmm, me too. We found out last week that, number one, the blessings of God are released into our lives through prayer. That's how it happens. Uh, I didn't make the rules. That's just the road map. Second thing we found out is sometimes in our life we only get blessings through persistent prayer. You keep asking God for the same thing over and over and over and over and over again. Like the widow, women did, like the widow woman did to the judge who didn't care about people or justice or anything. He said, I will answer you just to get you to shut up. And Jesus said, hey... Keep going to the Father that way. That's the way prayer is. God doesn't look at us and say, well, I'll just get you to shut up and answer you. That's not our God. Our God loves us. He's all about justice. He's all about doing the right thing for the right purpose. Let's finish this up today with looking at the last three of the five things that Jacob teaches us about unleashing the power of prayer in our life. Uh, I've, I took the uh, month of April off from Tub, and I've enjoyed worshiping with you guys down there it's it's a blessing brother chris i appreciate you giving me that break would you lead me in word would you lead us in a prayer brother before i preach thank you my friend heavenly father i thank you for this opportunity we have to come into your house and yes the lord, be involved in life and lord open up our hearts and tear up the fallow ground and make it good soil for the seed of the word and i ask you to speak to pastor Lord. yes god Yes, please, Lord. And God, you would lead us closer to your side, Lord. That we wouldn't worry so much about the things that we're facing in life, Lord God, but we would worry about coming closer to you. Yeah. Bless this time, anoint it, and humbly ask all this in your everlasting name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Here's the third thing. You need to understand that your blessings or your prayers aren't answered by you conniving with God. Or dealing with God or saying, I'll do this if you'll do that for me. That's not the way this prayer thing works. Last week we talked about how this guy who was wrestling Jacob, he asked him in Genesis 32, 27. What's your name? The man asked. And this time Jacob answered honestly, truthfully. And he says, my name is Jacob. Now the point is, it's not that this man from heaven didn't know Jacob's name. This guy's from heaven. He's Jesus, in my opinion. He knows everything. Been here since the beginning. And so when this wrestler asked Jacob the question, what's your name? It wasn't to get his name. It was to get him to get real. It was to get him to get honest with who he was. He wants Jacob to admit, my name is is Jacob, or literally, my name is Jacob, and I'm a liar. I'm a heel grabber. I'm a grifter. I'm a deceiver. I'm a shucker and jiver. I get what I want by grabbing life by the, by the horns and just get it into submission. Now, this isn't the only time in the book of Genesis. This is cool. This isn't the only time in Genesis somebody asked Jacob's name. Push rewind, and let's go back to when Jacob went into Isaac's bedroom with his soup. This venison stew covered with goat hair and covered with venison blood. This is what the Bible says in Genesis 27. When he came to his father, when Jacob came into his father's room, he said, my daddy. And he, Isaac, answered, here am I. Who are you, my son? And Jacob replied to his father, what did he say? You know what he just did? He lied. 
He said, here I am, I'm, I'm Esau, your, your firstborn, remember me? I've, I've done as you told me, please sit up and, and eat some of my game so that you may bless me. He lied. He lied so he could connive to get the blessing from his father. He's a shucker and jiver. He's a grifter. So that's what he did. He wanted something, and by all means necessary, he went after it. Conniving. But now he's up here on this mountain, and he's wrestling with Jesus. Jesus asked him, hey man, what's your name? Do you know what this old boy thought of when he was in his, eye, when he was in his daddy's bedroom and he lied? He said, my name's Esau back here and he got the blessing by conniving. And I got a question for you. What do you think would have happened if Jacob would have told this man of heaven and when the man of heaven said, what's your name? What do you think would have happened if Jacob would have said, my name's Esau? No blessing. Jacob had to get real with who he was. He had to confess who he was, what he was all about. He said, my name is Jacob. I'm a deceiver. I'm a conniver. I'm a shucker and a a driver. I've tried all my life to obtain these blessings for myself, by myself, and through myself. But I understand that ain't going to work when I'm dealing with you, Jesus. I can't connive you out of a blessing. I I I can't manipulate you. So what Jacob's doing is now saying, I'm repentant. I'm guilty. I'm guilty of conniving. I'm guilty of doing all that stuff. And so this is what happens. When Jesus said, what's your name? Jacob says, my name is Jacob. Jesus turns right around and says, baby boy, that ain't your name anymore. That name is, is, is a failed name. It's a broken name. It's a name with deception on it. It's a name that says you're a liar and a heel grabber, a shucker and a jiver. It says you're a deceiver and you'll cheat to get ahead. But that's not who you are now. Your new name is Israel, which means you prevailed with God and you won because of me. Church, I want you to understand something. In other words, God is saying, you're not who you used to be. Don't operate that way anymore. And this blessing that I'm going to give you comes from something far beyond your own conniving. I'm going to give it to you because I'm good and because I love you and because you're honest with who you are, about who you are. Jacob's new name, Israel, is going to appear. Check this out. Jacob's new name, Israel, appears over 1,800 times in the Bible after this. It's through Jacob that we get the Word of God because, you see, through the Word of God, we, 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 uh, we have experienced, we've got this Word in front of us because of Jacob's lineage. I'm going to tell you why. Guess who Jesus' great, great way on back grandpa was? Jacob. Y'all, these things, we would not have been blessed had Jacob not wrestled with this guy and been truthful with who he was. Going, it's going to include the blessing for, for uh, all of his family, And for for the whole world, church, some of you have spent your life striving and deceiving and wrestling and worrying to get some blessing. God, if I go to church three out of four times this week or this month, will you save my marriage? Lord, if I tithe, will you let that boyfriend be mine? Lord, if if I join the praise band, would would you let that girl notice me? Lord, if if I go to that connect group with my wife, would, would, would you make my kids get along with me? And we, we try to deal with God. We try to connive with God. We try to get something out of God. But you see the thing with, with Jacob. He didn't get the blessing by conniving. He didn't get the blessing by not being real. The only way Jacob got the blessing from the man of God was this. He said, Lord, I want the blessing, but I understand if I'm going to get it, it means I have to give up. I have to surrender. I have to acknowledge that you're God and that I'm not. And this is what the story is in there to teach us. I want you to think about this. For the rest of Jacob's life, every time he took a step, I think he probably felt that, that give in his hip, Jason. I think he always felt, even, even when he got old, I think every time he got up from a chair, ow, or when it started to rain, he felt in that hip. And this is the reason why I think so. Every time he took a hip, uh, every time he took a, 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 a step, that hip would remind him, son, the reason why you're blessed is because you wrestled with God. And you wouldn't have got the blessing if you wouldn't have surrendered. God, has God ever tore your hip out of socket to show you something? Has God ever tore your world apart for you to get a lesson? By God, I have. Been there, done that, got the t-shirt. Y'all, sometimes we got to wrestle with God and He will dislocate something in our life. But understand this, there's something better that's coming if we'll admit who we are. James 4, 2. 
You want something and you don't have it. So what do you do? You do everything in your power to try to get it. You lie, steal, cheat, you murder, you covet, you can't obtain. So you fight and quarrel. You can't get along with anybody. So how do we get it? You don't have, the Bible says, because you've not asked the right person. And every time I try to do something of my own, I always wind up monkeying it up. And what the Word of God is telling me is stop monkeying around with it and just give it to me. Surrender. Another lesson from Jacob about pressing through in prayer is this. God is himself the blessing that we seek. It's not that boyfriend you need. It's not the girlfriend that you need. I promise you, it's not going to be the money. It's not going to be any of that stuff. Y'all, we got to want God more than any other thing. We got to desire him more than any other thing. I want you to notice that at the end of the encounter... God does not say to Jacob, okay, Jake, everything's going to be fine. You go on home. Don't you worry about it. Go on. Esau is going to accept you with 11 arms. It's going to be happy, happy, happy. He never promises him that. Some of you spent your life striving and deceiving and wrestling, trying to get something that, uh, from God that you've been seeking on your own. He doesn't say everything will be beautiful. God didn't say that. Genesis 31, 3 says this. The Lord said to him, dude, go back to the land of your ancestors and to your family. And this is the promise I'll give you. I'll be with you. Question, church. Did Jesus, did Jesus promise him that everything's going to be cool? Mm -mm. Did he promise him that everything's going to be hunky-dory? Did he promise him that his, his family's going to look like it should be a 1950s American sitcom? Doesn't look like the Cleavers. He didn't promise him none of that. The only thing the promise is, dude, if you do what I say, I promise I'll be with you. In fact, God has made him limp now. So when, David, uh, so when Jacob gets there and if Esau still got a mat on for him, he can't even run away good. You go and I'll be with you. Church, what God assured to Jacob in this wrestling encounter was this. It wasn't that he'd be okay. It wasn't that his family's going to work out. It wasn't things were going to be perfect in his life. This was the one promise God gave him. And listen to it because some of you need to hear this today. God promised him this. No matter where you go, I'll be with you. Love that verse in Psalm 23. Surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life. You remember that one? Remember that that means that he'll go with you through the valley of the shadow of death. He's with you. Whatever you're searching for, you do know that it can't replace God. Oh, I want to be liked at school. I want to be popular. That doesn't replace your relationship with God. I want to do good at work. I want to advance. I want to make money. I want to make the promotion. That does not replace your relationship with God. Or I want more money. Or I need my healing. Or I want that person in my life. That boy, that girl, that man, that woman. Or I want stuff. And we pray to God and say, God, give me the stuff. And then we get mad because we think he doesn't love us because he doesn't give us the stuff. But this is the thing we got to understand about God. With God, it's not about him giving us the stuff. It's about, it's about him giving us him. Say, so, man, I'm just going to be with you. And if you're in the bad valley, I'll be with you there. If you're on the mountaintop, I'll be with you there. Man, is what you're looking for, is it the blessing or is it the relationship? Because, man, if it's about the relationship, even if you don't get your prayers answered the way you want them to, you still got God. If you ask me, that's a pretty good deal. I'll take him all day long and twice on Sunday. A relationship with God is better than any of his other blessings that could emerge from that night of wrestling. Let me say it this way. Jacob, in his wrestling match, he didn't get the resolution that he wanted. He didn't get the answer that he wanted, but he got the relationship that he needed. His problems weren't fixed. Oh, I love this. His problems weren't fixed, but praise God, at the end of this wrestling match, Jacob's eyes were fixed on God. His eyes were fixed. You're going to have to choose between those two things today, church. Do you want resolution? Or will you get up with the assurance of relationship? Do you want God to fix your problems, or do you just want God and man, until you can just want God, you're going to be in for a rough road to hope. Paul asked God three times, take away this thorn in my flesh, take away this thorn in my flesh, take away this thorn in my flesh. I don't know if that was just like three times, because to me, three doesn't sound like asking God very much. I ask God, you know, three times a day for gun smoke to be on at 8 o'clock, you know, something like that. But three ain't that big of a number. So I don't know if it's really three or 3,000. I don't know, but this is the thing. 
Paul went to God, gimme, 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 gimme. And you know what God finally said? He said this. He said, dude, my grace is sufficient for enough for you. This is what God was saying. In other words, hey, dude, I know you're hurting, but I want you to know something. You're not hurting alone. I'm with you. I'm with you. And you know what Paul said? Good enough. I can deal with that. He just kind of slipped into there and said, okay, God, if that's what you've got, I, if that's what you want, I'm going to trust you. God may not promise you he'll get you that job or that boyfriend or heal the person you desire, but this is the cool thing, y'all. He does promise us that he'll be with us. Sometimes the greatest effect of a night of wrestling with God is that it doesn't change your situation, doesn't change what you're in, but it changes your identity. What's your name, boy? My name is Jacob, liar, deceiver, shucker, and jiver. The man of heaven says, that's not your name anymore. You're no longer one who manipulates, but now you're the one who I'll call Israel, which trusts me, that adores me. Jacob thought Esau was his primary problem, but what he needed was for God to do a work in his own heart. In actuality, Jacob was Jacob's biggest problem. It wasn't Esau. Jacob was Jacob's biggest problem. It wasn't his older brother. Man, how many of us blame people, situations, problems, or our environment, or our past, or some trauma on, on the way our life is now? Oh, Mike, you don't know what I've been through. No, nope, but I know who God is. And I can tell you this, everybody's been through something. All of us. Sometimes the result of a night of prayer is the restoration of the relationship and not the resolution of the problem. Lastly, we know that God hears us because he became weak for us. Uh, for those of you who had kids or grandkids or nephews or nieces, you ever fought with a little kid? I mean, not like... Uh, Joan Crawford fighting, but... Uh, just wrestling with your kids. I'm, I was a big man, and when my little boys were boys, we wrestled. I didn't, you know, I did no nine one one calls or anything, but we'd wrestle hard. You know, we'd break stuff. But when I wrestled, I didn't give them full Fogerson. You know, I'm an old man. I got that stupid old man strength, men. You understand. And these little guys, they think you're a superman because you've got all this strength. But when you're wrestling with them, you don't give them everything you got. You hold back because you'd kill them. You'd crush them. When Jacob is wrestling with this man from heaven, do you think that man from heaven held back when he fought Jacob? Dude could have crushed him like an ant. He just said, boom, and Jacob, could, his particles could be blown in a billion, billion pieces and just, boom, gone. So that tells me something. This man from heaven, when he was fighting Jacob, you think he had to roll it back to about a two or a three? Yeah, because Jacob was fighting out of his weight class. I mean, how much does omnipotence weigh? It had to weigh more than the buck 25 that Jacob weighed, you know, in this fight. My point's this. We know that God hears us because he came weak for us. If you're wrestling with someone smaller, you hold back. Jacob is fighting with somebody who's much bigger than him. Jacob could have been crushed, which means this. God voluntarily had to dial it back. He could have kicked that boy's tail, but he dialed it back. Jacob could have been crushed, killed, and he would have deserved it. He's the deceiver, a liar, shucker, and a jiver, cheater. So God dialed it back. But let me tell you something. Just because he dialed it back, it doesn't mean the power wasn't there. Because you fast forward to a hill outside of Jerusalem in a place called Calvary. All that power and all that fight and all that judgment that would have been poured out on Jacob was poured out on, G on God's Son on Calvary. It didn't go unsatisfied. It just got poured out on the tree. God hanging on a tree on the cross 
And do you think for one second Jesus couldn't have called 10,000 angels from heaven down? Do you think for one second Jesus just couldn't have said, Father, this is too much. I'm coming down. Do you think for one second that scenario could have been played out? Absolutely not. It very well could have happened. But this is what happened. Jesus lowered himself and took all the wrath and all the fury of God. He lowered himself, became weak for us. Church, listen to me. Sometimes it seems like God's not listening to us, but He is. The cross assures us to keep pushing. In that moment, God dialed in the way to the strength to bring Jacob salvation. He dialed it in so Jacob could get a blessing. Church on Calvary, the Son of God, God in the flesh, dialed it back in and took all of the wrath and judgment of God so you and I could be blessed. He took what belonged to us. God cared enough to come down to Jacob to wrestle with him. And God cared enough for us that he came down and he took on flesh and wrestled with our sin until it squeezed the life out of him. And because of him, you and I can have blessing and relationship with God. And now he's united us to him forever. And he says this, and these are some powerful words. I will never leave you and I will never forsake you. Even if I'm going through a divorce, I will never leave you and I will never forsake you. Even if I'm going through withdrawals, I will never leave you and I will never forsake you. Even though I fell off the wagon, I will never leave you and I will never forsake you. Even though I'm struggling with this in my heart, I've got doubt in my heart, I will never leave you and I will never forsake you. Church, that's a promise. That's a promise. Remind God of it time to time. Lord, you said you'd never leave me. You said you'd never abandon me. Can I tell you what? God will always keep His word. And if He doesn't, it'll be the first time ever. He told you He'll never leave you or abandon you. Y'all, we spent the last two weeks with this one pioneer of the UFC, Jacob, learning some things about prayer. I'm going to hit those for you real quick. Just Here's the five. The blessings of God are released into your life through prayer. Secondly, sometimes the blessing comes to our life through persistent prayer. You might be five prayers away from getting your breakthrough, 30 prayers away from seeing somebody saved in your life. Don't stop praying. Number three, the blessings of God are not obtained by our contriving or our conniving. You can't deal with God when you're talking about this stuff. It's not, God, I'll do this for you if you do this for me. It don't ever work. Number four, God himself is the blessing we seek. If you're seeking stuff instead of the Savior, you're going to be sorely disappointed. Number five, we know that God hears us because he became weak for us. The cross shows us that God loves us enough to humble himself and become a person just like us. Y'all ever feel like this? You ever feel like your prayers don't make it any further than the ceiling? Like a steel dome over your bedroom or wherever. It's like all the prayers just keep coming right back down. I ain't doing no good. Is anybody up there? I've been. Been there. Done that. Something hit me this week. I will never leave you or forsake you. Do you understand that when you're praying and you feel like your prayers are just coming right back down to you? Understand this. God isn't 12 trillion miles away trying to hear you. He's right beside you when you're praying. And if they're falling back down on your lap, you need to understand something. Jesus is right beside you. Your prayers are making it further than the ceiling, whether they are or not. If they're coming right back down to your lap, your Savior is right beside you. You say, hey, remember, I'll never leave you and I'll never forsake you. Keep praying, man. Pray until something happens. Don't give up. Don't give in. You might be just a few prayers away or a prayer away from your breakthrough. Don't stop. Can I tell you what? It'll never be God who'll tell you stop praying. And if it's not God, then who do you think will tell you to stop praying? That's the enemy. Because prayer is the conduit that God will release power and promise into your life. Some of you need to call the power company today and have some service restored into your life. You need the lights turned back on. If I could every head bow and every eye closed. Miss Pam, if you'd come up, I'd appreciate it. Y'all want you to think about the state of your prayer life right now. Maybe your, maybe your prayers are, are, now I lay me down to sleep. I pray the Lord my soul to keep. Or maybe your prayer, yeah, maybe the prayers you do are, Lord bless us for this, uh, Lord bless this food that we're about to receive. Maybe that's kind of about the extent of your prayers.
My friends, those are prayers that we teach children. And they're fine prayers. There's nothing wrong with them. But that's the starting space. That's the starting spot. Are you growing in your prayer life? Some of you need to start wrestling a little bit more with this stuff. You need to wrestle with it. Because there's blessings that are unclaimed because you're not claiming them through prayer. There's healing that's unclaimed because you're not claiming them through prayer. There's victory and breakthrough and overcoming that's available to you, but you're not getting it because you ain't asking for it. Or maybe you're trying to do it in your own strength. You're trying to stay sober in your own strength. You're trying to save your marriage by doing everything you possibly can. Hey, I love you. Wake up. You need to understand something. The only person that can take care of all that mess, it's not you. Perhaps you're the reason why the situation is the way it is. You need to go to God. You need to go to God. You need to go to Him. You've been monkeying with this too long in your own strength and in your own might and your own intellect. You need to give it to Pops. Brother Mike, I don't think he hears me. Well, he says he does. And I just happen to believe him when he says something. Church, if I could, I'd ask you to just stand to your feet with your heads bowed and your eyes closed. Today, maybe some of you have given up some things in your life or some, some requests to God. You've just given up. Maybe you prayed for 10, 20, 30, 40 years. Never had, never, you've never seen any resolve. You've never seen any action. Don't stop praying. Maybe you've been praying for six months, and to you, that's a long time. Don't stop praying. There's a blessing that comes through prayer. Sometimes there's blessing that comes through persistent prayer. Sometimes the only thing God will do, He won't change your situation, He'll change you. But you don't get any of that without praying. In a moment, this altar is going to be opened up for that very thing. Maybe you need to take just about 30 seconds, two minutes, I don't care. Whatever, what, however long it takes. But in a moment, I'm just going to ask you to come to the altar and come before him in brokenness and say, God, there's some things that old boy said today just kind of hit me between the eyes of my heart. And I've given up. Shame on me, Lord. I'm sorry. I'm Jacob. But I want you to give me a new name today. Man, if you want to get back in that fight of prayer, you want to get back in that struggle of prayer, you want to get back into that. For those who come forward today, I want you to know that this is a public confession, a public commitment to re-engage on the kneel. You're going to re-engage with the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. You're going to re-engage with the God of Israel to come into your life, bring blessing, and bring His presence. Almighty God, I pray in the name of Jesus that those who come forward today to make a commitment to uh, a recommitment to prayer a recalibration to prayer, a new commitment to prayer. Lord, I pray blessing before they even put their first foot into the aisle, uh, into the aisle today. As every head is bowed and every eye closed, would you come right now? If you just want to recommit your prayer life to God right now, nobody looking around, but you can come. Just step out of your pew right to where you're at, the altar. Just take a knee or take a stand and just say, God, I'm here. I want you to know I'm here and I love you. And I'm in the fight. I'm in the fight, Lord. I ain't giving up. I'm going to seek my blessing. I'm going to seek your presence. And if that's all I get, if all I get is your presence in my situation, that's enough, Lord. I want you. People are coming, people are coming, people are coming. Men, women, they're coming. This ain't no show. This ain't no show. This is between you and God. My goodness, God is as real as the air I breathe. I couldn't wake up in the morning without Him, and neither could you, and you know it. Man, if you're standing there and God's doing something in your heart, just come on up. Or maybe you're just standing there saying, man, I hope this thing hurry up and ends. Do me a favor, just start praying for people at the altar. Oh, Lord God. Yeah. This is your invitation. This is your invitation. I won't hold it out any longer than I need to.
But there's people coming back to God today with their prayers, recommitting themselves to prayer, recommitting themselves to intercession, recommitting themselves to communication with God. You sing that chorus with me, church. I surrender all. I surrender all. I surrender all. I surrender all. All to thee. All to thee, my blessed Savior. I surrender. Sing it to him again, church. I surrender all. I surrender all. All to thee, my blessed Savior, I surrender all. Church, thank you so much for coming out. Uh, this morning and last night as well. Uh, thank you for joining us online. We appreciate that. I hope you leave here today encouraging the spirit about your prayer life. Keep pushing in. Don't give up. You don't know what's going to shake loose in the spiritual realm. So keep asking. Keep pushing. Keep praying until something happens. Don't give up and don't give in. The God you love says, I'll never leave you and I'll never abandon you. Never forsake you. And that's a promise that's worth holding up. All right, let's go to him and have a word to close in prayer. Billy Rose, brother, would you, uh, uh, Miss Pam, we're going to go back and back and love on people. Billy, would you leave some word to close in prayer? Thank you, buddy.